Have you ever reached through a bag of beef jerky, got it out, put it in your hand, mouth, and then realized about three seconds later that there was nothing but ants in your handful? What? Yeah. That's... That was that's terrifying. How, that's how hungry you were? No, no, I was, I was a <laughs> kid. There was beef jerky. I was like, oh, hey, beef jerky. Bam, bam. On my hand, there's just all these ants rolling around. I'm just freaking the fuck out. I went to the lab today. Oh, he's recording. <laughs> I went to the lab today, and I got this. So the recorder is back. And thank you, last time, for uh, you know, lending me your batteries. That was really helpful. Okay, so the recorder is on. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with um, with this class. So we'll we'll talk about the solution to the homework assignment, unless you know the the entire class wants me not to do that. <laughs> Tomato can, yeah, that's my response. Because otherwise, you know, we'll go ahead and talk about that a little bit. You know, I think most people get this one just fine, you know, because um, some people came to me and asked me for that, you know, which is good. And I think the problem with this homework assignment is too easy, and people say, you know, it cannot be that easy, not from tech. <laughs> and no, it's really that simple. It's yeah, really that easy. I did it three times thinking I did it wrong, because it only took a few steps. <laughs> Okay, so so this is the, the theorem, and we have to use the solution for la from last time. So what you need to do is to uh, use the CNF from last time, and then uh, attach the negation of the theorem that we are trying to prove. This is the theorem that we are trying to prove here. So let's go ahead and just redo the whole thing. I'm just going to redo the whole thing too, because it's a good reminder to myself as well. Go. So here's the text editor. We'll go ahead and redo the whole thing. Okay, so from last time we have Q or V. Q or R implies P. This is already done last time, so you don't have to do it. You don't have to copy this at all. Okay, and then we have S at the end. Um, so the CNF from last time is basically just you know, deriving this part here, the negation of Q or R. And then we have a or P here. And P, not P, or S, and then S all by itself. Then the first one, you can apply the Morgan's law. It becomes not Q and not R. And then the entire thing, or P. And then we have not P or S, and then we have S here. So this is the only term that needs to expand, and I should probably put in equal signs here, because each line is equivalent to the one before. Okay. All right, so last time we also used um, the distributed rule to, do, to work on this one. So now we have not Q or P. No? Was that what we worked on last time? Do Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out yeah, what I did last time. I think this is what we did last time. Yeah. Okay, and we're done. Okay. So this is from last time. This is the CNF from um, the previous homework assignment. So with a new homework assignment, we have to first identify what is the theorem that we're trying to prove. The theorem that we are trying to prove is this one here. Not S implies not Q. So what we need to do is to take a look at this one. So we say it would be helpful if you, you know, label what you're doing. Okay. So instead of giving me, giving me a bunch of equations, it is helpful to say the theorem to prove is the following. It doesn't have to use exactly these words, it just has to tell me what it is, okay? Not S implies not Q. And so the negation of the theorem to prove 
is going to be just the negation of that, right? So we just put the negation on top of everything here. And then we can expand this one, uh, turn it into its own CNF. And this one turns out to be very easy to work with. Um, this is be this becomes not uh, not not s or not q, and then we apply the Morgan's law. Well, before we do that, we can simplify. It, it becomes s or not q, and then we apply the Morgan's law to turn it into CNF. The Morgan's law, once it applies, it becomes not s and not q. Well, not s q because the, we have a not not q, so there. Um, we, the, the double negation goes away. All right, so that's the, the so this is the negation of the theorem that we are trying to prove. So what we do is, and so we say to prove the theorem, we put everything together. In other words, we take the CNF from the previous homework assignment, and then we add it, we add this part. Okay. So this becomes one you know, larger CNF, and we want it to get to contradiction. But it does get to contradiction in one single step, because we have a S here, and then we have a not S here. So when these two resolve, they resolve to false, which is zero. And once we get to zero, because this whole thing is one big gigantic conjunction, if there's one false term, then the entire thing becomes false, and we're all done. Okay. So this one has no tedious steps. Yep, go ahead. Uh, is this scenario that you need resolution? It is resolution. It's more of a CNF. Hmm? More, it's more of a CNF than... More of a CNF thing. Like, no. Right, there's no resolution, but this is still resolution. Yeah. If you if you think about it, it still fits into the resolution pattern. It's just that, you know, yes, there's another way to interpret it and say that, you know, S and not S cannot be both true at the same time. Yep. So we didn't need to do any expansion or I mean, I know I can, I can see it over there, but I thought we still, still wanted to be. No, you don't have to. I mean, you know, that's, that's okay. Yep. But you do have to identify that you are combining S with not S, and that resolves to a false. So you still need to identify that. Okay. Are there any questions about the homework assignment? Okay, no questions? All right. If there are no questions about the homework assignment, I think we are ready for the first exam. So today we are going over a practice exam, which turns out to be the actual exam from last year. So this is not you know, just some made up exam that may be way too simple compared to the actual exam. This is actually what people took last year. This is something that probably made somebody else cry, is what you're saying. Mm, I don't remember that. <laughs> mm. So it's on my apps.lostwheels.edu drive. Not shared yet. I will. Oh, wrong password. Um, this is the actual exam for that exam. So the practice ex exam that you see on Moodle is what I used last year to prepare students for the actual first exam. So this one is a, is a better estimate of you know, what kind of question you'll be getting. All right, so we'll go to CISB 440, go to the 15th spring, the first exam, and so when you said it wasn't shareable, were you going to put it on Moodle? Or Mo yeah. I think that, okay, it depends on which one is already on Moodle. I cannot remember. Nor can I. Do you, do you remember, uh, Mickey, do you remember where you found it on Moodle? Uh, yeah, I think it was in the... Uh, Under which topic? Propositional logic. Propositional logic. Under propositional logic. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Propositional calculus? Yeah, yeah. Oh, exam one practice questions. Okay. That's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this one, yeah, I think the uh, actual exam is a little bit more involved. So we'll go through the actual exam and we, 
if we have time, we can come back to this one. Okay, so we'll take a look at the actual exam, which is this one here. Um, this is important stuff, you know, to, it's usually good to describe this you know, before the exam so you guys, you guys know what you can do and what you cannot. Um, the exam is open book, open notes, but no electronics. Um, for this particular test, I really don't think even a simple calculator is going to be needed. If you think that you might need one, you, know, you can bring along a simple calculator or a scientific calculator. Okay? I don't think you will need it. Um, it's an individual assessment. Okay? In, if you read the uh, syllabus, um, basically everything that we do in this class is individual. So the score should reflect the competency of the student with the name and student ID as indicated above, which is up here. And you might want to remember that I, I want last name to be the first one because you know, that's how I grade. Okay, Moodle uh, list students by last name first. So that's why I want these to start with the last name so I can actually arrange it a little bit easier, more easily. Um, Answers should be independently and originally derived in the allotted time frame, observing all the rules applicable, no sharing of open book notes material during the exam. So if you, um, if you want to study together and come up with you know, like shared material to be used in the exam, just make copies of that. That's all. <coughs> Do not discuss the questions with Students who may not have taken the exam, look at that kind of goes without saying. Um, use additional sheets of paper if necessary. So you have to bring your additional sheets of paper if you think you might need it. Write legibly. This is one of the worst things about you know, exams is I can, if I cannot read the answer, I cannot give points to the answer. And occasionally I will get a blob of ink that I cannot really discern what is actually written. Uh, sometimes it's because of your bad erasing, okay? So the, instead of erasing, it's just smearing. <laughs> so that is, that's not helpful. Uh, questions weighted as, questions are weighted as indicated, they do not have equal weight. I might change it for this exam, so you need to kind of be careful about, you know, how much, uh, how many points are associated with each question. This exam accounts for 20% of the final grade that's you know, coming from the syllabus. Are there any questions about this part here, other than the time is not matching our time or the date is not matching our date? Any questions about the uh, instructions? Okay, no questions about the instructions, moving right along. Okay, the first question. Okay, the first question is, you know, show the elements of set X. Assuming it is defined as follows. So this is x here. It is defined using this bunch here. So the question is, what is, well, okay, there are two questions. The first, que the first question is, you have to show me all the elements of x. And the second one is, you have to tell me what is the cardinality of x, okay? All right, I know there's a lot of uh, curly braces matching. And let me see if I can bump up the font size here and zoom in a little bit more. <coughs> is there a zoom control somewhere? Yeah, that one. Yep, right there. Under 50? Is that better? Yeah. All right, cool. All right, so what we want to do is to see you know, what type of elements can be, uh, they're duplicates, are they duplicates? This is one set, it has an element of one. Okay, cool. This is another set, what is the element in this overall set? It is another set with an element of one. So now the question is, is this the same as that? Nope, they are not, okay? Very good. So one as an element is not the same as a set with one itself as an element. They are not the same thing, okay? All right. And this one obviously is just another one because it's, it's a set of a set of a set of one element of one. So that is also unique. We haven't we have seen nothing that is there are duplicates just yet. Okay. And then we have a set with two elements. The first element is a one, the second element is a two. Obviously, in this case, this one is overlapping with 
this one over here, because you know, one itself is an element in both sets. And then we have another set here where the only element in the overall set is a set of two elements with one and two as elements in that set. So it is also unique because we do not have another element from anywhere else that is, an, that is a set of just two elements, one and two. So that means the answer to this question is, you know, x is a set, okay? It has one as an element, it has two as an element, has a set with one as an element, with a set in a set, and one as an element. And the last one is a set of one and two as elements. Okay, so that is, those are the elements of the set X and now we just have to count the number of elements in set X. That's one, two, three, four, and this counts as five, okay? So the fifth element, nothing to do with the movie, is one single thing, okay? It is from the perspective of set X, it is just an element. Now, but the element has two elements in it, yeah, it doesn't matter, okay? You see the entire set, the highlighted portion, as one single thing. So the cardinality of x is, well, five. five. So bar x bar is five. There we go. Are there any questions about number, question number one? Yeah, um, yep, just ahead. for clarity, that last set is that very last Mm -hmm. That element itself actually comes from that last part. Right? Correct. Yeah, this element comes from the last set in the union. Okay. Good. Yep. Uh, would you please tell why one and the set of one, like the first two, are not the same again? Okay. Let's say you have an integer. Okay, integer i has a value of five. You have an array of only one element, and that element also has a value of five. Are those two things the same? Can you compare that entire array that only has one element with a single integer i that has this, they have the same value? Would they be the same? Exactly, so that's okay. the reason. All right. Second question. Yep, go ahead. Why would it have uh, numbers two and, and a separate element? Because, ooh, we don't, I guess we, it comes from the second last set in the union. Yep, there you go. Any other questions? Okay, no questions. All right, so the second question is asking, well, this is, a, this is easier, I think easier than the first one. Um, what is the Cartesian product of a set of one element, which is one, times you know, the set of one element, which is also one? What do you think? Okay, but you have to spell it out correctly. What are the punctuations? Okay, so it is a set with only one element, and the one, el the one, the only one element is a two tuple of one one. That's the element in this particular set. Yep. Can I ask the question about the previous? Yeah. Yep. Question number one. If it were instead the intersection of one and a set containing only one, is there anything in that set? Okay. Say that again. So it is the intersection of one. One. And this recorder. <laughs> and a set of one. That cannot work. Okay. Because uh, intersection and unions, they only work on either, either side has to be a set. One is an element, it is not a set by itself. Okay. Is that okay? Yes. Yep. So it, it, it doesn't work because you don't have the right type of value on the left hand side of the intersection. It has to be a set by itself. Yep, go ahead. No, it, it's it's just not defined because this operation cannot happen because it doesn't have two sets 
on either side. But isn't it a set on there? It said it's, it's in set braces. But that makes it a set. The curly braces turn something into a set. So if you change that question to be one with a brace and then a one with two braces, what would be the answer? You mean like this? Yeah. Then the answer is going to be an empty set. Because they don't have any overlaps. The point is one as an element is not the same as the set with one as an element. The element is not the same as the entire set. Yeah, if you if you work with files, okay, you know, A B C dot txt is a file, okay, and then you have a folder called test, and then inside test the folder you have A B C dot txt. These two things are not considered the same. One is a file, a text file. The other one is a folder. They are not even of the same kind of thing. So there's no, no way to compare those. OK? Any other questions about number one? Because it seems like number one is the one that is more, has more questions. Because <laughs> we keep going back to the number, the question number one. But it's good that we talk about it now because you know, in your test, then you know, you know what to deal with, how, what to do with it. But you also know that I do not ask the same question twice. <laughs> so that will only leave you thinking about what is, all, what is going to be ending up in the actual test, right? product of two sets, each one has two elements. That's like one, two, cross. Okay, one, two, and then we can cross AB, would that work? Okay, so that's easier because we can easily tell which one comes from which one. So the Cartesian product of, of these two is going to be a set by itself, and we already know the number of elements in the resulting set because it is just exactly, well, it's the uh, product of the, of the I, I told you. Know, I told some of you that you know, my speech center is not working right today. The cardinality, okay? It's the product of the cardinalities of the set where you do the cross product. Okay. So we know there are four things in here, and they would be. The, yeah, it's just the first one from either, the first one from the first, the second one from the second, the second one from the first, the first from the second, and the second from both of them. So that would be the Cartesian product. So to just clarify what you said, so the number of the number of elements in the cross product of the right. set is going to be like if the cardinality is n with right. one and n. So if you look at set A, Cartesian product with set B, the Cartes the card no. the cardinality of the Cartesian product is going to be bar A bar times this is arithmetic multiplication. Yeah bar B bar. Okay. It's guaranteed because you have to take each one from A yeah. and then you say, okay, you know, B, you know, each element of B can be a partner and then you expand it out. And then you take the second element of A and then you do the same thing. Any other questions? Is that answering your question? Mm -hmm. Yep. Can we do something like uh, uh, a set that just contains one partition product of so one has two and one has one. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at this one, and we just take out the B in the second set. Would that work? Okay. So you only have two elements left because there's no B, so that becomes your answer. Is that okay? All right. 
Okay, any other questions regarding Cartesian products? Let me ask you a tricky one. I have a set A, and I want to do a Cartesian product with the empty set. What is the result of that? It's a cross product. So the end result should be a set of tuples where the first element comes from the first set A and then the second element comes from the empty set. Can anything come from the empty set? No. No. So that means the result is an empty set also. <coughs> yeah, it is kind of like that. <laughs> but you can also see how this particular thing matches the rule about the cardinality. Because in this case, the empty set has a cardinality of zero. So it doesn't matter what, how big A is, okay, because you're, you're crossing it with an empty set. So there's nothing, there's no result from crossing it. Yeah? What can you cross the set A with to get the set A as a result? You cannot. It, not. It's not possible. Okay. There's no such thing as identity in Cartesian product because the resulting set is always going to be a set of two tuples. And two, A2 tuple cannot be the same as an element of either of the contributing sets. So. Since it can't be either, it just becomes an empty set? Sorry, say again? And since it can't be either, it just becomes an empty set at that rate? Cannot be either? It, it, can't, have, I, it can't have both the empty set and A, so um, it's just empty. Never mind. I think I can if at least one set of the Cartesian product is an empty set, then the result has to be an empty set. Okay. They can both be empty sets, but the result is still just an empty set. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. What if you, is it possible to cross a set with a set within a set? <laughs> yes, you can. I don't see why not. You mean something like this? Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't see why not. It's, it's really the same exception. thing, you know, because those concepts do not interfere with each other. They are quote unquote orthogonal. Okay, so let's take a look at that one. So this crossing with, is that what you're asking for? Okay. So the result is really just, you know, a two tuple, right? So each element of the resulting set has to be a two tuple, where the first element comes from the first set. Well, in this case, the first set only has one element, so we only have one to choose from. The second element has to come from the second set. It has to be an element coming from the second set. Well, which is a set of one, just like that. That's the that's the result. So they don't ever have to be like the tuple doesn't have to consist of the same type of elements. No. It's just you know whatever you know the other set has you know. Yep. So then if the second set were actually a million long instead of just that one, then it would be one comma and then a set with a million stuff in it, right? And that would be your only element. Okay, so you're saying the second set has a element which is a set of a million items. Yeah. Yes. Then you have, you know, the same thing, which is a single two tuple as the result, where the second item of the two tuple is a set itself that has a million items. Yes. Whereas each element of the one, the one of the, you know, any one of the one billion elements can also be a set, can also be a two tuple, can also be a three tuple, and so on. Yes. Yep. All right, so out of curiosity, you're not going to ask this a question that's going to be like a set, a Cartesian product with a set, with a set B. Okay, you know, you know the thing about, you know, don't think of a pink elephant? <laughs> you, you, when, when you say tech, you're not going to ask that question about blah, blah, blah. What are you doing? Okay, well, my, my question is this. Uh, if, you have, if you have, like, a row, okay? Mm -hmm. If we have uh, a set with a mm -hmm. Cartesian product with a set that contains the set row, yeah. and you ask us how many elements are in Row is infinite at this point, right? Okay, let me ask you this question then. Okay. All right. Since you guys are asking that question, okay, this is Z is the set of all integers. Okay? 
So what do I get here? Yeah, exactly. No, no. What I'm asking you, if you had, if you had row in there, row, well, why would it? Yeah, row, 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 yeah, which can yeah. represent an infinite amount of things. In but, 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 see, but, 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 but row itself is a set. Right. But what I'm saying is, you're not going to ask what the cardinality is. Like how many elements are in that set? But what's the cardinality of the natural number? You wouldn't have a cardinality. cardinality. It would be just one element yeah. since it's within yeah. the yeah. set. If it's within the set, all of that is one. Okay, there are two answers to that question. One is if you have a set that has an infinite number of elements, then we cannot really talk about the cardinality as a number. Okay. But then we can still refer to the cardinality of a set that has an infinite number of elements using countability, which we haven't talked about yet. So I will not ask that question. So that's that's my two-parter answer to your question. So basically, it's not. Say again. No. Okay. But but this one, you know, this is tricky because z is even though z is the set of all integers, which means it has an infinite number of elements. In this case, we have a set where the only one element is another set. <laughs> Look, it's not silent, right? <laughs> that means it's very urgent. Oh my god, sorry about that. <laughs> Listen, so no problem. It's either very urgent or your phone got hacked. I, 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 if, if I were you, I would, you know, kind of move away from Mickey because it would probably may, may, may initiate a self-destruct sequence. <laughs> victim of, uh, we, we don't know what those lithium iron batteries can do when they short out. <laughs> Preferably, I'd never find out in person. Actually, they explode. <laughs> Preferably, I'd never find out in person through practical testing. Right. And that's why we have lithium polymer batteries, which do not explode. Um, okay, question number three. Question number three is given any, any, any is actually in italic, any two sets A and B, what is the intersection of A minus B or the difference of A and B intersecting with B minus A, which is the difference of B and A? Now remember, subtraction is not commutative in arithmetic, right? So it is also not commutative when we perform these operations. Wouldn't that be the empty set? It would be the empty set, yes. But why is it the empty set? Because you're asking for what's inside of A that's not in B, intersecting with what's inside of B, not inside of A. Exactly, yep. yep, that's the best way to look at it. A minus B is what is in A but not in B, and then B minus A is what is in B but not in A. But if you do the intersection of those, then you have nothing. Because you know the entire thing, you know, if you look at each one, it it has to be from A or B. Yep. There you go. Yep. Can we draw the Venn diagrams for that? Absolutely. I cannot, you know, draw it on the. Well, I suppose I can using like ASCII art. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You know, since I talked about it. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I just have to remember which letters I chose. A, B. Okay. That's it. Okay. So we can do a A. Apology is not yet. Okay. And then we have the Bs, right? Now the difficult part is to do the overlap because these are both A and B. So I suppose I can do it like this, maybe. So A B A B. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the intersection is this part here. Okay. These elements are in both set A and set B. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah see, it, it doesn't take, it doesn't take that long. Okay. You know. Okay. So now we want to calculate the difference, right? You know, A minus B. A minus B are all the elements in A, but not in B. Okay, so that would be, okay. I hate to be lazy, but I am. Okay, so if you look at this portion, okay. Okay, everything to, that's, that's hard to highlight 
If you look at just this portion, that's A minus B, because those are the elements in A, but not in B. Is that okay? Yeah. And then if you look at this portion, these are the elements from that are found in B, but not in A. Yeah. So, so when you look at those two, okay, what we're looking at here is this. Okay, this is A minus B, this is B minus A. Do they have any intersections? Nope. Because we just took out the intersection. Yep. Yep. So how would we write the answer? How would you write the answer? No. The answer is an empty set. So you just use one of the two ways to this to uh, uh, denote an empty set. <laughs> it's that little thing here, you know, that's also known as the empty set. It's kind of like a zero. Or you can spell it out, you know, E M T E M P T Y S E T. You know, that works too. Good thing this thing is not going to be graded by Moodle. Okay, there's no pattern matching. You know, if I can read it, it's good. All right. So question number four. Now this one is a little bit longer. Okay, so it'll take a little bit longer, but it's not too bad. So let's read the question first. The question says, given that f is a function, it maps a domain D to a codomain E. <coughs> Indicates properties of f that has to be true. Okay, f has to match these attributes for each case because of the condition stated in the table. It is okay to say cannot tell if you really cannot tell. Okay, you know, is it you know in, injective or not, or um, if it's surjective or not, or is it bijective or not? Note that if you know for certain that f is not injective, for example, you have to spell it out and say it is not injective. Okay, all right, all right. So let's work on this one here. So the only condition that we know is the cardinality or how they compare. In other words, in the first on the first row, we know that there are fewer elements in D than there are elements in E. Okay, that's the only thing we know. We don't know the function itself. But what can you conclude for sure given that the domain is a smaller set compared to the codomain? Yep. It's not It's not so It's not we know it cannot be surjective, okay? So we'll put an N here because we know it is for well, certain it cannot be surjective. What is surjective? Cardinality of the domain. Has to be mapped. The cardinality of the same. So that means if, if you want a function to be surjective, what has to be a requirement in terms of cardinality? They have to be many elements in the domain. Exactly, D has to be greater than or equal to E in terms of cardinality. In, in this case, it's exactly the opposite. So we know for sure this cannot be surjective. What about um, injective? Can't tell. Cannot tell. Cannot tell because you can have you know, a lot of elements in E, and yet every single one of D maps to one single element in E. Because with the function, you are allowed not to use up everything in the codomain. You have to use up everything in the domain, but not in the codomain. Okay. So if one is n here, okay, the other one has got to be n. Because even though you cannot tell whether it is injective or not, because it is not surjective, it cannot be bijective. So that's why you have to pick n or no as the answer to bijective. Let's take a look at the next row. They are exactly the same. If they're exactly the same, can you say for sure that they have to be injected? No. No. Which means you, you have to say cannot tell. Exactly. You cannot tell whether it's surjective or not. It can be, but it may not be. So as a result, in terms of bijective, same thing, cannot tell. All right, the last one is D is greater than E, or the cardinality of D is greater than the cardinality of E. So there are more elements in the domain than there are elements in the codomain. Is it injective? 
But can we say it is for sure not injective? It's for sure not injective. Exactly. We need to use all we need to use all the elements from the domain. Yep. But we don't have enough elements for the exactly. to match one to one. So okay. Exactly. So it has to be non injective. Okay. So you cannot use cannot tell here because we know for sure that it cannot possibly be injective. There are two there are more elements in the domain than there are elements in the co-domain. In order for a function to be injective, it means everything in the domain has to map to a unique item in the co-domain, which implies you need to have at least as many elements in the co-domain as there are in the domain. Okay? So that gives you an end here right away. Okay? Can we tell whether it is for sure surjective? For sure, non-surjective, or we just cannot tell. We cannot tell. It can be surjective. Oh, just simply because it could happen. It can be surjective because you know, you have more elements now in the domain than there are co-domains. So you can use up everything in the co-domain, but you don't know exactly how it is mapped. So that's why you cannot tell. So, are there any questions about this one? Now this one kind of spells out everything that I can possibly ask regarding you know, injectiveness, but only using cardinality as a clue. So if I were to ask a similar question, then I would have to change the condition and not use the cardinality as a clue, so I would have to use something else as a clue. I, have, I don't have an idea of what I'm going to ask yet. So, it's not going to be so if someone were to beat me up in the parking lot, I would still not be able to answer the question, what is going to be in the exam? <coughs> oh, I was going to do that. That, <laughs> that might make me more creative, though. <laughs> uh, next Monday, one week from today. Tuesday. Oh, Tuesday. 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 All right, question number five. Question number five is to describe F that maps, this is the domain, okay? So the domain is the Cartesian product of true-false, true-false, to a codomain of true-false. The function is defined to be just implication. X implies Y. And I want to know whether it is, oh, surjective, not subjective. Surjective, there we go. So I want to know whether it is surjective, injective, and whether it's bijective. Okay, so what do you do? The first thing you do is you define the whole function. Okay? Well, let's go ahead and define the function. F is a set, right? It has how many elements for sure? It has four elements, okay? So we have four elements here. And I'll just add the commas to separate Okay. Now, technically speaking, for each element, the first one is a two-tuple, and the second one is just true-false. Okay. Go. And I already know what two tuples I have to deal with, because we got false, false. We have false, true. We have true, false, and true, true. Okay. All right, so can someone tell me true, uh, false implies false. Is that true or false? True. It's true, very good. In fact, whenever the first one is false, the second one, the whole thing has to be true. This is the only time when it is false, and this one is true too. Okay, so given that f as a function can be written as a set of these two tuples, where the first tuple itself is by itself a two tuple, is it surjective? Did we use ended up using all the elements in the code domain? Yes, we did. Okay, very good. So we'll say this is in fact surjective. Um, is it injective? Can it possibly be injective? No. Just looking at the domain and the code domain cannot be injective. So we can say it is non-injective. But because it is non-injective, it has to be non-bijective. Because bijective means it, it has to be both surjective and injective. So this one cannot possibly be bijective. There we go. With this, um, I mean, we get no benefit from not showing the work. But 
do we have to show what the, uh, the set turns out to be, or can we just give the answers? Mm, I think these three will give you, they carry all the points. Okay. Even though I say describe, but I didn't say exactly how to describe it. So in your test, when I say describe, it means it'll spell out all the elements. Okay. back a little bit of for for the second uh, tuple. Uh-huh. How is it that you have Even this one? Yes, how is it that you have false true and then it equals true? Because A implies B is the same thing as not A or B. Whenever A is false, the disjunction has at least one element or at least one side that is true, that makes the whole thing true. But aren't you uh, using A as in that inner uh, part? No, a, is, a is the left element inside that two tuple. Right. So B is the right element? Yeah. B is the right it's element. It's Sorry. The so, so X X would be the, the right element. Okay, so yeah, the zero one, X is the zero, and then your Y, or whatever, the B. B would be the one in this case. So what you have is not false or true. No, no, but then, then x is 0 implies that y is 1. See, that, that's what Yeah, false saying. implies true as a condition itself is true. By definition. Because the definition of implication yeah, the is this. The definition makes sense. It's just I don't, I don't see it. It's just the two-pool action. Like this. Mm -hmm. this, is, these are, this is the implication? The implication is over here. This is the result of that. So these are, yeah, so it's not false. Okay, so what about the rest of the class? Is that okay or not? Go ahead. Can you just like to write down a small table? Yeah, I mean, it's not a definition. You mean like a proof table? Yes. Like that? For the second one? Well, the second row corresponds to the second element. So you have, you know, whenever A is false, we know that the whole disjunction has to be true because not false is true, and this is a disjunction. If at least one side is true, the whole thing is true. So we know these these two are true to begin with, right? So the only one that has that can possibly make it false is this one here, where A itself is true, not true is false, but B is false also. So that will make the end result here to be false, and then the last one is true as well. Because B is true. Yeah. So we assign the ones and zeros based on the f of x that is where x implies y. We assign the zeros and ones by position, yes. So x is the first one, so x is the first one, it is, it's the first item in the Cartesian product. Y is the second argument, so it is the second item from the Cartesian product. What I'm looking at is where you already have f equal to the set of uh, first two four, you know, so is it zero zero uh, comma one? Yeah. So the zero zero and then comma one, the one was assigned because of the x. Okay. Y. The zero zero yeah. comes from the domain, which is this particular set. The one comes from the codomain, which is coming from this set. But uh, you assign the one based on the f of x, x and f of x, y, right? Or it's just yes. So the, the zeros and ones as the result here, these are based on the definition of implication. Based on the, you know, if you look at the, look, look at the truth table, it will give you the same result. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions about number five? Number five, another movie. <laughs> Twenty-five. Yep. What was the average um, for this test last year? I cannot remember. Oh, uh, was it that bad? <laughs> no, I just don't remember. Or is you know. that group tech? If, if I make all the tests open book and open notes, do you expect me to remember? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Let's not be too cocky now. <laughs> No, I don't remember. 
All right. Ooh, I just deleted one too many items. There we go. Okay. So in propositional calculus, as discussed in class, one is an element of which two sets? Okay. So you now you have to dig up the definition of propositional calculus, and then you go like, okay, what are the components of the proposition, propositional calculus? Okay. I will just use the English version, well, whenever possible. There's the set of alpha, okay? What What is in the alpha set? Constant variables, variables, constant variables. Okay. Constant variables. variables, constants, and what we call schematas, okay? And one is for true, okay? Does true fall into one of those three categories? It's a constant, okay? So A is, is the right answer, okay, good. Um, which are the... We have a set of omega, right? I'll just spell omega here, or just like insert equation. Uh, okay, that's fine. And we'll put in omega. There we go. What about omega? Can one in be in omega? What is omega? The, a set of all the connectives, operators. True is not an operator, so it's not in omega. Okay, so get rid of that. That's not. That's not the answer. Uh, what else? Iota. We have iota, okay, which is you know, just uppercase i. Okay, what is iota? What is it? What what are the elements in iota? Things, Things that are known to be true. true. Okay, so do we define true to be true? Yes. Yes. So it has to be in iota. Okay. So a is alpha, i is iota. Um, what else? There's one more set. There's one more set to define. Propositional calculus, zeta. And what do we have in zeta? Transformation, transformation rules. Is true by itself a transformation rule? It's not. Okay? Hmm? It can be on one side of the transformation rule, but it's not a transformation rule. It's the rule itself. Yeah, because for anything to be a rule, you need to have that symbol. And one obviously is not that simple. So it cannot be in zeta. So that means the answer is really just these two, okay? Alpha and iota. Okay, moving on to the next question. Okay, this one, you know, it, it looks really long because I give you all the axioms, okay? And I give you, you know, like, ways to refer to the axioms. So when you apply the axioms, you can refer to, oh, I just use axiom 1.2, I just use axiom 1.9, and so on, okay? And the question is, using the axioms, prove that false is not true. For simplicity, the use of commutative and associative axioms 1 and 2 can be implied and not be made explicit. I made the mistake of not deleting the actual solution. So, you know, but that's just a solution. I did not quote the rules. So let's go ahead and do that part. Okay, let's quote the rules. Okay. All right. So here's the first one. Okay. Oh, I can't do that because it's a math equation. Fine. Uh, okay, let me see if I can just add. You know, it's the page break thing. It doesn't let me insert anything. You can bring notepad up and just yeah, we can just do that. Okay, so we'll go ahead. Or I can just highlight it. Okay, so zero is P and not P. How do I get that? If you look at the rules up here, okay, let's see if we can find it. P and not P, down at the bottom. 1.7, very good. Okay, so this is one quick and easy way to make false. Okay, any variable and the negation of the very same variable is that. Okay, yep, go ahead. So this table of rules and axioms is going to be included on the test or do to bring a copy? For anything that I think you probably will not remember, I will include it. But since it is an open book and open notes type of exam, I assume that you will bring along you know, everything that is needed. And besides, in this case, I give these specific numbers, and in my notes, you know, they are not, they were not numbered. Yep, go ahead. Would it be possible, do we have to use a lot of rules, right? We have to do what? We have to use one of the rules in the table? Yes. We have to do Yeah, so every single step, you have to quote which rule you are using. We can't just say um, not, not one, which is a rule that's over there, one five. 
one five. Yeah. Not not one. Just one. But you but this is p. P is not one. You can't you cannot use that. Okay. Yep. Okay. So now we look at the second one, which is you know linking the second to the third term. Which rule did we use in the table to make that happen? Double negation. Okay. And what turn it into like this? It's uh, De Morgan's law. So it's one of the De Morgan's law, and they're collectively called 1.4. And then from that, we get back to this one. And which rule did we use to get, to get back to this one? 1.5, we got rid of the double negation. And how do we know that not P or P is 1? 1.6, that's it. Yep. So you said you would provide us with a set amount of rules, but right. would that just that set you bring, you give us, would that be enough to solve the answer, or would we need to bring more on our own? No, that should be enough to solve. Like in this case, you know, yeah. I just use all the rules that are presented. All right. Yep. That part where it says for simplicity, did you add that just now, or was that was it like that in the test? Seems like it was in the test. Yeah, it's in the original test. So, so you kind of like just get these things that you have to put it together. Yeah. Okay, but you didn't say anything about 1.6 at the end. 1.6. Well, he made reference to it because in the parentheses, if not p um, or p is equal to 1, then no. negating that would be negating 1. But you see how he has 1.1 and 1.2 in there, but... Uh, Oh, he said he never, he never actually made reference to the one point six. Yeah. Right. The answer the key does not have references to these specific rules, which is just like what I did. Okay, so you don't have to actually. No, you do. do. All you do. Oh. <laughs> but he's it he's putting the, the exact part of the rule that yeah. so that way we don't have to search for it. Right. So no, he didn't do it completely. Yeah. So he doesn't oh, have right. to scroll up fifty times and like, hey, it's the uh, third one of this box. And, and not just so when you do it, you have to pull the. Oh, God. So you have to remember like, the law and, like, the actual name of the rules. No, no, you just use the numbers. You just reference these numbers. So you include references in each step, you know, which means you know, these numbers. It's like making a fun function call instead of having to redo the function every time. Yeah. yeah. All right. Question, question number eight. Fill in the following truth table, which obviously is already filled in, <laughs> to prove or disprove that this expression is equivalent to this expression, which means they are the same all the time. Every single time you have this expression, it's always the same as the other one. So the answer is yes, they are the same, because when you look at these two columns, they're exactly the same. They have the same values. All right? This one, I don't think you know, I really have to do it, because it, it really is literally just you know, use the values of P and Q on each row and figure out the result of each formula. I mean, so it's not, it's a little time consuming, but it's not uh, difficult. So the theorem is in fact true, so remember to answer the second part of the question, you know, it is, the theorem is true. Question number nine, consider the following definitions. So we have relations this time. R1 is a subset, not necessarily a proper subset, but it is a subset of z crosses z. z is the set of all integers. It is less than the relation, is the less than relation over all integers. In other words, r1 is less than. r2 is greater than. So state the properties of r1 and r2. Tell me whether they are reflexive or not. Does anyone remember what is reflexive? It means, it means what? what? What makes a particular relation reflexive? Okay, so let's say you know, we are dealing with this one here. Okay, so we have a set Z, okay? We have a relation, let's call it R. Okay, not even R, but R2. Can someone tell me what is, what does R look like? What is, give me one element of R, possibly. It's a, okay, first of all, it, is it, are, they, are these integers? Each, is each element of R a number, an integer? Yeah. 
No. And what is it? It's a two tuple, right? Because it relates two things. It relates an integer to another integer. Okay? So give me a random relation. Okay, I don't even need it to be one of those. It doesn't have to be less than or greater than. Three zero, okay? Three zero. For whatever reason, three relates to zero. Okay? But that's what each element looks like in a relation. Is that okay? So now, when we look at R1, what do you think is in R1? R1 is the relation of less than, okay? Not less than or equal to, just less than. So I, I can give you a whole lot of examples. Zero comma one in parentheses is one element because zero is less than one, okay? One comma 20 is in the set because one is less than 20. So for the same reason, an element in R2 which is greater than is can be three comma one in parentheses because three is greater than one, and so on. Okay, so is are we okay in terms of knowing what type of elements we are talking about in R one and R two? Okay, is it reflexive? Can't be. I mean, because what to be reflexive, like we're saying, what makes what else? makes a relation re reflexive? I don't know how to say the words, but like. Uh, reflexive, if that was reflexive, then we'd have also an element of 0, 3? Mm. No, that's, okay, look, look at the three words, okay? If you look at the three words, symmetric is what you just said, okay? A, R, B implies B, R, A. That's symmetry. Okay. What is reflexive? A, R, A is reflexive. A. Oh, okay. Oh, so for right. each element in okay. Z or in the set of integers, the relation applies. It has to self-relate. Okay. So equality is self-relating, right? Less than or equal to is self-relating, but less than is not self-relating no. because one is not less than one. No. So one one as a two tuple is not in R one. It is not in R two either. So it is non-reflexive. Okay. If something is non-reflexive, can it be equivalent? No. no. So we know the answer of those two questions right away. Non-reflexive and not equivalent. What about symmetry? Symmetric. They're not symmetric. Okay. One is less than three. Three is not less than one. So they're non-symmetric. Is it transitive? Yes. It is transitive. If one, one is less than three, three is less than 10, one is less than 10. Okay. So you might want to dig up the definitions of reflexive, symmetric, transitive, and equivalent when it comes to relations. If you think my notes is too terse, okay, or just for whatever reason you don't understand, you know, what I'm saying, look up these words in Wikipedia. Okay, there are multiple resources you can dig up these things. Wikipedia is one of them. The other one is Moolfriend. Okay, Wolfram.com. Nobody knows. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah, 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 come on. That's, yeah, we know what that is. How do you think you do school? <laughs> well, how do I, I? I'm not a mind reader. For all I know, you guys can be thinking about the vampire thing, right? Oh, no. <laughs> no. The wrong class. The wrong class. Yeah. In our notes, we have a, for a definition of reflexive, we have this set where uh, it has things that, like you just said, but then A, a uh, two A and C. Well, AC is, you can have extra stuff. Okay. Yeah, but for all elements, you know, CC has to be there. So that means, you know, it, it, it just has to say, you know, it has to be self-relating, but you can have a lot of stuff too. Okay. Yeah. So that's a good question to ask. Okay. All right. So now that we know that R1 and R2, are, they are both, okay, they both have the following properties. Non-reflexive, non-symmetric, transitive, and then not equivalent. If I combine R3, if I combine R1 and R2, because after all, each one is a set, if I make a union out of those two and define that as our new set called R3, what can we say about the R3? And is there a common name for the relation R3? Does what do you think? Huh? 
did a proper step? Not equal to? No. It just not, not equal, equal to. to. Very good. Okay, somebody said not equal to. Yep, go ahead. Uh, it's not reflexive, but it's symmetric. <coughs> it is non-reflexive. It is symmetric. Yeah. It is not transitive anymore. Okay? And as a result, it is also not equivalent. Is that okay? Sort of. What makes it transitive? What makes it transitive? Okay, transitive means um, A, R, B, and B, R, C implies A, R, C. Not the school A, R, C. <laughs> ARB is a Air Resources Board. <laughs> That's you know, if if a particular relation satisfies this requirement for all elements A, B, and C, then it is called transitive. Is that okay? All right. So the more common name is just not equal to and then you have to define you know, all the properties. I think question number 10 is the last one. Describe a bijective function. Okay, this one, you know, I don't think I will ask this because we did it as a homework assignment already. Okay, so that, we'll, we'll, we'll re I'll read it out anyway. In other words, find a function that, so that given any natural number, 3D coordinate, it maps the 3D coordinate to a unique natural number. Remember your homework assignment? That's what it is. That's what it is. And this one only goes one way too. It doesn't ask for the reverse, the inverse function. It only goes one way. So I don't, I, I don't think I'll be asking that question. Any other questions? Yep, go ahead. All that magic is what you showed us. When we did that homework assignment, you did most of the work, and all we had to do was Actually had them do all that work on the test? No, well, when they did this, you know, they, they, could, they could have done it using an example. In other words, oh, okay. yeah, they, in fact, what I did with the previous class was I illustrate a way to do it in class that is graphical. Okay, so it's much more hands on. So, you know, you have X, Y, and Z. So, remember how, you know, in the two dimensional space, this is how we assign the numbers? is going out. Okay, so in a two-dimensional space, we fill in the numbers in a diagonal line like that, right? And because we are sweeping diagonally, we are guaranteed to be able to fill in as much space as we need to, okay? What about the 3D space? Well, you cannot scan with a diagonal line, but what you can scan with a plane. So you basically move a diagonal plane outward, like this. Yeah, so you still have zero at the very center, right? It's kind of hard to see it. Then you have a one over here, and then you have, because you have to scan it out, you know, and you have to cover the base first, so you have one, two, and then a three here. And then you have a four, five, six, then you have a seven, you know, that's yeah. on the next yeah. level. Yeah. yeah, so you basically fill it up, you know, using, it, it's another triangle, which is one step further from the origin. And then you have another triangle that is also one step further. So if people can show me those, you know, that particular pattern, they, if they get the point. <laughs> <laughs> but I talked about that in class, last time I taught this class, I talked about the graphical way to do the mapping. So this is not new back then. This was not new to the students. But you did say you were going to take that off the table. We didn't get the 3D plane. Hmm? We didn't get the 3D plane in our class. Right. We did the other way, which is actually in a way easier. Yeah. Because you just pick any two dimension, fold it into one. Once that becomes one, you fold it with another one. So you keep folding until you get nothing left. But you get one dimension. All right, so that's the practice test, you know, that I, well, this is the actual test from last year. Are there any questions? In terms of scope, it is going to be the same, okay? So we cover everything up to and including the last topic, which is resolution in propositional calculus.
Yep. We get the full class time to do the test? Yes, we have all 80 minutes to do it. And I'm going to spend, yeah, go ahead. Um, yes, it will be available. In fact, I think it is already shared. It's just that the link I have not shared yet. So we'll go ahead and get the link, put it into Moodle. share cookies with the other one. So we go back to this one. So copy link location, paste it here. Let's run. Let's enter key. It will ask you for your student ID, okay? So you just you know, type in your student ID to sign in to the Lost Reels Google Drive. Yep, it's all good. You guys can try it too. You know, it, it should also work on the cell phone. It, it doesn't display it correctly on the cell phone, but you should still be able to see it. Yeah. Um, this is just kind of like a concept question. So, um, is there any is there any way to like kind of take what we're learning and apply it to code? Like, say, if we don't have like a, I, I, uh, the majority of the stuff we've been doing has been like background stuff. Is there a way for us to like? practice any of these concepts in You mean like in actual C, C++ coding? Yeah. Use it in a way that would actually help us as we are now. Hmm. That's kind of a reverse question, you know. Okay, we must, do, do remember I used an analogy to talk about, you know, the math that you need to work yeah. on in, the, yeah. in computer science. It's like Tai Chi. Yeah. And your job is a cop, right? You know, so. But, but you're not going to use Tai Chi on a criminal or Why someone not? that you're trying to catch. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's what exactly. I'm saying. So this class is almost exclusively yeah. just a graduation yeah. requirement that you should know how to do this stuff, but you might not ever really use it. It does give you the vocabulary for the more advanced classes, the upper division classes that you will have to take at a four-year university, including um, automata, which is also called computation theory. Uh, analysis of algorithms and stuff like that, they will go back and refer to all the terms that we have talked about in this class. So a part of this class is just to give you the vocabulary in terms of mathematical terms to prepare you for the other classes that you will have to take at a four-year university. And then the other part, you know, I think for the most part, you know, is a good exposure um, because some of you, you know, will become computer scientists. Okay, Hopefully. where you work on theories and stuff like that, right? Um, so for those of you, you know, who have the ability or want to do that, this is an exposure to go like, oh, there is a branch of computer science that is more math than programming. There was a, a hand somewhere. No? Okay. So I'm not sure whether that answers yeah. your question or not. Yeah. Sort of? Okay. Yep, go ahead. It's basically no. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Let's see. We have yeah, I mean, to do it. Yes, we do. Five more minutes. Okay, so the question is on the one that is already on the website. We want to go to the fourth question. Oh, I think it was one. I'm the wrong person to ask, but I would assume. Number four. Yes. Okay, number four is given that F is D, has a what is the cardinality of, okay, the cardinality of which two sets must be the same? Okay, that's, a, that's okay. I like this question. <laughs> How many sets are we talking about here? Two. What number was it? No, 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 there are three sets, okay? Yeah. D is a set, what E is, is a set, number four, Q4, okay? 
Okay, D is for sure a set. That is our domain. Yes. E is a set, it is our codomain. But there's one more. The F itself is a set. Because F is a set of two tuples to map elements from D to elements of E. Right? So I'm asking of these three, which two must have the same cardinality? F and B. F and B, correct. Yeah. Yep. Because the domain yeah. must have the same number of elements as the function yeah. itself. Yep. I read my own questions and I ask, you know, how did I come up with that? <laughs> <laughs> Would the answer be that um, A itself, because your at the intersection of A and B, mm -hmm. the intersection of A minus B becomes um, the A set, correct? Or nope, it's not. Um, the answer is just A intersected with B in this case. Because A intersected with B will give you elements that are in both, right? And then you are intersecting it, not union, okay? You're intersecting that with elements that are in A, but not in B. Okay. Oh, I take it back. Okay, never mind. I take it back. So, <coughs> so it's only the stuff that's in A and B, and then the other one is in A, but not in B. So the end result will still be an empty set. Okay. This time I'm not going to use ASCII uh, ASCII <laughs> art. <laughs> So we got A, we got B, okay, and they have some overlapping, okay? So A intersecting with B is this portion here. This is A intersecting with B, okay? A minus B is the portion that is in A, but not in B. So that would be this portion here, but excluding the intersection. So these two are disjoint. They, are, they do not share any elements. <laughs> So when you take the intersection of these two, it is an empty set because they do not overlap. Okay. Any other questions? But see, this time it is not in the on the projector, and you guys have to actually write it down. <laughs> Any other questions? So I would, you know, okay, this is something that I did with all of my other classes, so I feel that, you know, I should be doing it to this class so that it's fair. The way I'm gonna ask questions or come up with the questions is I would probably go through my own videos and you know, kind of glance through what I talk about in class, and then I would get, you know, ideas of you know, what questions to ask. So what are you going to do to study for this class? Knowing this is how I'm gonna come up with questions. Watch your listen, listen, listen to the really quiet parts of the video. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and also read the notes, okay? Because everything is also still based on the notes, so make sure you read the notes. I know some of, some parts of the notes are very difficult to read, okay? It's very abstract, very dry. So what you need to do is to think, when you read something that is kind of abstract, you have to think about you know, the, the three questions, the how, what, and why, okay? Because that will help make it less boring because it will be less mechanical you have a big picture of what it is. The second part is don't let go of anything unless you really understand it. It's, because reading it is not gonna help unless you can link all the key concepts to stuff that you already understand. So that's how you're gonna study in order to get the material. And as you study, on the side, jot down the notes, and then use that as your help you know, to help you with the exam. Okay. Can you tell your folder for the system 40 class on YouTube, or do we have to just search for each upload video? Yeah, you just have to search. I don't have a specific channel for that. Okay. I know how to make uh, new channels, but there is no easy tool to import videos across channels. Well, some of you can. <laughs> <laughs> that would make a very, very long playlist. <laughs> Alrighty. So I'll see you guys on Thursday. There's no homework. Okay, so you guys today. Spend some time studying. I'll be right back. Yeah.